Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it's okay, because um, what we're going to do, I would, <clears throat> I would do mostly drawing anyways. And then when you watch through the slides, you'll just see some additional information. So that's okay. So the last thing we need to talk about, about populations, uh, is on one of the two Ds. And what are the two Ds of population ecology again? Uh, diversity and dispersion. Density and dispersion. Uh, yeah. Right, dispersion, how are they organized through space? <clears throat> Density, how many individuals are packed into a particular area? And there's one more thing we need to talk about, and that's how do you make predictions about what's going to happen in the future? There are two ways you can do that. One, you can do it based on the current growth rate. And so towards the end of our time yesterday, we left off with these types of curves. where we have, on the x-axis, we have time. On the y-axis, we have population size. And so time will be represented usually in years, um, unless you're dealing with something that is like a fruit fly or something like that where years are virtually irrelevant because their generations are three or four days long. Population size in terms of number of individuals. And we have something that looks like this, okay? So you could predict what's going to happen in the future. Usually. Yes. Usually. Yes. Um, you can predict it based on this. If you know what the carrying capacity is, right? We know K, and what is K again? It's the carrying capacity, but what is that? Yeah, right. Like uh, how, like the population, the maximum population of environment. Yeah, the total number of individuals that 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 ecosystem or that environment can sustain. So you can make predictions based on how close you currently are to K, right? So if, let's say you're at this point right here. What would you predict about the future of this population? Is it going to continue to grow? Yeah, Katie. It'll grow a little bit. Yeah, so it's going to continue to grow, but this growth rate is, it needs to start to slow, right? Because we're going to transition from exponential growth into, and this is now logarithmic growth. Logarithmic. Okay, so we know we need to start making that transition as we get closer and closer to K. Um, why is time one? Uh, time in years. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Like so, yeah, I know that's confusing because it's the x-axis. Let's do this. There we go. Time in years. Okay, so that's one way. You can predict it based on where you currently are in, in, in the growth. If you're really far away from K, you should be growing exponentially. If you're close to K, you should be kind of, your growth rate should be slowing down. And so you have an idea, and, and, and some ecologists will argue that most populations are fairly stable because they're close to K. But what does that assume about K? So if you say, you know, we're going to predict that over a 20-year period, this population is really not going to grow or shrink at all because it's really close to K. But what does that assume about K? K doesn't change. That K doesn't change. Right? Hi. Hello. Good so morning. sorry for the interruption. I actually went to the wrong classroom. I didn't know here. This is AP Bio. Is yes, right? it is. Hi, I am Mrs. Black, and I run the dual credit program here. And I do you have like two minutes that I can hand a absolutely. flyer out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. So uh, I'm not sure if this has been announced in class or not, but with this class being added, it is now dual credit also <laughs> with our dual credit program. Um, thanks to a lot of hard work um, this summer that took place. Uh, it has been submitted and approved, and our dual credit registration actually begins this next week. So that's just why I'm kind of swinging by the classes. I'm going to see Mrs. Cato's government class next, is that I wanted to make sure you guys were aware that this class can count for college credit for the registration period in order to register for that. And you register with Colorado Christian directly, starts on Monday, and then goes for a whole month through October 15th. So these flyers, which I'll just leave with you so you can hand out whatever, whenever sure. it's most convenient, tells you a little bit about when the meetings are. So if your parents have never been to a dual credit meeting, if they're wondering what are the advantages of getting college credit besides saving a lot of money kind of thing, there are many that 
it spans. Um, those are all going to be discussed at these meetings, and the representatives from Colorado, you know, from Colorado Christian, will be there with a whole presentation, a question and answer period. So that's really the opportunity for them to come and ask any questions. And then right after that, we'll have a bank of computers, and the representative and myself will help parents register students right there, or they can do it through my email link that I'll send out after the meeting in case they miss it. But I just wanted to make sure you guys all were all in the loop that it's coming up, it's here, okay. and these are the meeting dates. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Yep. All right. So again, this is one way to do it. Another way to do it is based on what's called the age structure. Okay? The age structure. So we'll have another type of diagram um, where you basically you have a you have a vertical line in the middle and then you have this these bless you these graduations on this vertical line that represent increments of, a, of an organism's lifespan, okay? So we'll do an age structure for humans because that's the lifespan that probably most of us are most familiar with, right? So what's, what's the average lifespan of, let's say, a human being? Yeah. 72. Yeah, somewhere between 72 and 78 years, depending on which particular developed country you live in and whether you're male or female. Okay, on average, females live longer than males. It's not necessarily because there's a big physiological difference. It's because there are a lot more males in their teenage years that die than females in their teenage years. Anyways, that's another story for another time. Okay, so let's say that these mark five years. No, let's do, uh, let's do 10 years. Okay, so every graduation is worth 10 years. So this one is 10 years. This one is 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, okay? We don't have a lot of people that are 100 years old, but there are some, okay? So let's say, let's say our age structure looks like this. And then on the, on the x-axis here, so our y-axis is right in the middle, and the x-axis, we're basically representing proportion. Proportion, proportion of population. So it's not a number of individuals on the x-axis, it's the proportion of the population that's in that particular window. And say we have something that, oh wow, got to go up to that next graduation. Say we have something that looks like this. Okay, so here's our age structure. So somebody describe to me what you see in this age structure. Structure. Where's most of the population? Yeah. Yeah, the biggest chunk of the population is is right here, which would be aged 30 to 60. Okay. And so we've got a, a large percentage of our population that are towards the end of their reproductive years and even beyond their reproductive years. So what you would predict about a population structured like this is that they are not going to grow very rapidly in the coming generations, okay? Because most of your population is here in late reproductive years or beyond reproductive years, and you don't have a lot of individuals here that are going to come and replace them. Okay, does it make sense? So this is a typical age structure that you find in a developed country. Okay, where you basically have either just enough people in the generations behind to replace those, or you're actually shrinking. Okay, so you would predict that it's either going to remain pretty close to the same, or it might even shrink a little bit in the coming generations. But if your population looked like this, Hello. hey, good morning, Emma. Sorry, Emma. There was so much traffic. Okay. If your population looked like this, your population looked like that, what would you predict about the size of this population in the coming generations? Yeah, Kyle. 
Well, maybe, but logarithmic or it could even be exponential, but what would you expect about the size of that population? Okay. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be growing, right? Because the bulk of your population, remember this is 10 to 20, so the bulk of your population is in the early part of their reproductive years or is about to enter reproductive years, right? And so this is a population that is poised for growth. All right, and so this is, this is kind of the last aspect of population ecology, and that's what you would call forecasting, okay? Giving an idea of what, what your population density is going to do in the future, all right? Make sense? Yes, sir. We love it? Love it. Love it, okay? All right, well, that's it for chapter 53. We're going to transition into chapter 54 and start talking about community ecology. And then as we, when we do our first lecture break, we're going to do an activity on community ecology. When we do our second lecture break, we're actually going to go back and, and do some more population ecology stuff. And you're going to make some predictions and do some more writing practice. So if there aren't any questions, we'll transition over to 54. And what I want to do at the beginning of our time talking about 54, I want you to take out a sheet of paper and I want you to write on the sheet of paper what percentage of chapter four, 54 you read in preparation for this class. Okay? Just tell me what... You were supposed to read all of it. The question is, if what percentage were you supposed to read? The question is, what percentage did you read in preparation for class day? Okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just take a piece of paper. Yeah, we're gonna yeah, you're going to give it to me. Can we just write a big old number? Yes, but don't write it too big because I'm going to give this piece of paper back and we'll, we'll keep using it in oh, future so one videos. Piece of paper. One piece that of paper. we're going to use for a long time. Yes, I but like one for you, you know, one for Tori, well, yeah, one for I'll Kyle, just, yeah. not everybody on this, one, one for Emma. You don't need to title it anything, just make sure your name is on it and tell me what percentage of chapter 54 you read in, in preparation for this class and then keep that sheet of paper next to you and I'll get it in a little bit. It was a lot of pictures. It was not a lot of pictures. It was a lot of pictures. Yeah, there were like, oh, there were like so many pictures. There were like seven there pictures. Were and there was so much information. I was reading, I was like, taking in one thing and then they threw another thing. Exactly. Well, that's, 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 you know, that's why we spend time sorting through all of this out together. And coaches make it all make sense. Yep. Hopefully. All right. Okay, so hold on to that sheet of paper. Just set it to the side. I'll grab it in a little bit. And uh, anyways, yeah, and so don't worry. Don't be like, man, this is a waste of a sheet of paper because we will reuse this paper many, many, many times. Okay? Many times. Should I write like a chapter? No. You don't need to worry about that because whatever your most recent writing is, that I'm, I'll know. Yeah, I'll know. All right. So, chapter 54. Somebody, somebody explain to me what a community is. Okay, this is another word that in biology has a very specific meaning different than the way we typically use this word. Mark. A community is um, our, our, our separate like, populations of, yes. um, of different species living together in, in, in an ecosystem. Yes, yeah, good. So a, a community is all of the populations that are living together in the same place at the same time. And the key there is they have to be close enough that they can interact. It doesn't mean they're going to interact. It means that they're close enough that they could interact. Okay, And that's the key there. So the community is basically describing everything living in a particular area. All of the plants, all of the animals, all of the bacteria, all of the fungi, all of the uh, other organisms that fit into some other category, the miscellaneous organisms, okay? So it's everything. It's everything living in a particular area. So what's missing? And how do we get from community to ecosystem? It Katie. excludes the things that aren't living. Yeah, it excludes what you would call the abiotic factors, climate, landscape, you know, watershed, nutrients, okay? But other than that, the community is everything in a particular area, okay? Everything living close enough that they can interact. That make sense? Okay, cool. 
success. And so in the textbook, it actually gives you an illustration of what it means by an interaction, and it shows you a crab that puts an urchin on the back of its shell to actually protect itself, right? It's fa fantastic. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful illustration of one of these interactions. Yeah, Mark. Another one, though, like, it's like one of the ones you see, like, right away, or it's like the, the little, this little fish inside the eel's mouth. That's the eel. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, and you've got relationships between um, blind fish and shrimp, or blind shrimp and fish. I mean, it's just wonderful. All right. So we have two different types of interactions that we talk about with regards to animals. Okay. One of them is called intra-specific interactions. Intra-specific interactions, and you have inter-specific interactions. Okay, intra-specific and inter-specific. Intra-specific is among members of the same species. So what we are doing right now is an intra-specific interaction, right? We're all gathering together. We're, sh we're I was going to say we're breaking bread together, but not yet because we haven't opened the bag of M&Ms. Okay. And so uh, this is an intra-specific interaction, right? Interaction among members of the same species. Okay. But then we have inter-specific interactions between... Species. How many of you have a pet of some kind? Okay. And so your interaction with your pet is an inter-specific interaction. And as humans, we have some pretty sophisticated inter-specific interactions. And then what we can do, what was that? Dolphins. What, what we can do, they are pretty cool. Uh, what we can do is we can actually describe these interspecific interactions by the impact on the species. Is it a positive impact? Is it a negative impact? Or is it virtually no impact? Okay? Is it virtually no impact? And so the first example of an interspecific interaction that we're going to talk about is competition. Okay, so remember, interspecific is between species. First one we're going to talk about is competition. Competition. Now, if you were to describe the impact of competition on the two species interacting, how would you describe it? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it neutral? Mark. Um, it, it usually isn't good for either. It's not good for either of them. You're right. It is, it is a negative negative. It is a lose-lose. It is a lose-lose interspecific interaction. What's that? Yeah. 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 And so minus this is negative, right? It's bad for both sides. Yes, Isabel. Uh huh. Big mistake. But I did, and yeah, this is all in there. Yeah. This is it's like all AP environmental science. It's all coming back. No, I failed the test. It was really bad, but like. <laughs> <laughs> but but this, but but oh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it connected with something oh, yeah. that you do. Okay. So why why is competition a lose lose interaction? Yeah, Mark. A lose lose interaction is because the competition would usually refer to the the fact that there's limited amount of resources to go around. Yes. These species. Um, like trying to get the same resources as other species, and that you might, you might even go up to the other I mean, fight, fighting for it. Absolutely, right? There's only so much food to go around, and so if you are competing with another species for that food, it's a lose lose. Even if you can outcompete that species, you're not going to get as much food as you would if that species didn't exist. Okay, make sense? It's like 
having a little brother. I had a little brother, and we shared a bedroom. We shared everything. I still have a little brother, but we don't live together anymore. <laughs> so now we're we're more we're more friends, but kind of awkward friends that have shared really difficult history close? together. No, we are pretty close actually. He's forgiven me for all the things that I did when we were children. Uh, but it's like, so I am the older brother. And my brother is built like my mom's side, and I'm built like my dad's side. And it, here's, here's what that means. My brother is three inches taller than I am, but weighs 130 pounds less than I do. Okay? And when we were kids, the, the weight difference wasn't that extreme, but it's just, like, just suffice it to say I was the better competitor. Okay? But still, I didn't get as much as I would if I didn't have to share it with him. So we shared, and it was an unequal sharing of resources, but I still didn't get as much as I would if, if, if I didn't have to share it. Okay, that's the idea of competition. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Isabel. So it's negative because obviously one side loses, it's negative for the other side because they're not getting as much as they could? Yes, even if they win. Even if they are better competitors, they're still losing something to the others. Okay? And so, the, bless you. The whole idea of this can be summed up in basically a single concept. We've got this scene. You almost made it. You know, I, I feel like I might be allergic to this room as well. Anyway, so we, we have this concept called the niche or the niche, if you want to sound fancy, right? It's like foyer versus foyer, right? Do you? Because it's fancy, right? It's, yeah. So, so the niche, the niche of an organism and there are basically two ways where, that you could describe the niche. Here, one way to do it is everything a species needs to survive. Everything a species needs. We'll just say needs, right? Because to survive is implied, right? If it needs it, it needs it to survive. Animals don't need things like we need things, right? We're like, I need this, but you don't really need it. You just want it. Okay, it, animals, they actually need things. Good morning. Okay, so that's one way to just define the niche. Another way you can define it is this way. The ecological role of the species. It's still describing the same thing, it's just a different perspective. This is an, uh, a, a species perspective. Wow, that was really hard for me to say for some reason. This is a species perspective, okay? It's everything that species needs to survive. This is the community perspective, okay? What role does that species play in the community? Okay, so it's the same thing, it's just a different perspective. The niche is determined by the competition, okay? So this is not defining niche, but we're going to say is determined by competition. And the way we sum this up, determined by competition, and you basically have this idea, the realized versus the fundamental. And I don't know if you remember this from your reading or not, but the fundamental niche or the fundamental niche is all of the places where you could expect to find that particular animal, okay? Or that particular plant or that particular fungus, whatever it is, okay? With that particular living organism. So the fundamental niche or the fundamental niche is all of the places that you could expect to find it and basically anywhere where you find everything the animal needs, right? Remember the niche or the niche, it's everything the animal needs. And so what you find though is as you go out and you study particular ecosystems, you find a lot of ecosystems that include everything the animal needs. And then you wonder why isn't it here? Why isn't it here? How many of you have been to a beach before? Okay, this is good. All right, we're, on, we, we, we're all on the same page. Okay, have you ever 
been to a beach that had a little bit of rocky substrate. Yes. Okay? It, it's hard to walk on. It's not horrible. Let's be careful no, there. it's bad. I went to Greece, and, like, I was stubby on it, and I got budget cuts on, like, that's not great. No cute. No cute. But it's not it's not made for humans is, is the problem. Okay? But have you ever actually paid attention to all of the animals living on that hard, rocky substrate? There are none. I haven't seen the walls. Well, there are some. They're just not like the tide typical. Pools. Yeah, so well, you've got tide pools that have anemones, and sometimes fish get trapped in there, and sometimes you'll find hermit crabs and other wonderful things moving around in there. But even on the rocks, you've got barnacles, which don't look like animals, but they're animals. And you've got, what's that? Yeah, well, sometimes you have coral, coral struggles if they, if they can't always stand or walk. But here, here in California, you'll find California mussels growing on those rocky, other kind of mussel. Like, I've got your California muscle. Uh, wow. Anyways, um, but what you find is a lot of areas in that rocky inner tidal, you find everything you need for a barnacle to survive. But it doesn't grow everywhere in that inner tidal. And so that's how you can see that there's a difference between this fundamental niche which is where you would expect to find it, which is everywhere you can find everything the barnacle needs. And it's realized niche, which is oftentimes far less than that. And what do you think is explaining why there's such a difference between the realized niche and the fundamental niche? Climate. Okay, that could be, although if climate is different, then you probably don't have everything the species needs, right? <gasps> What are we, what's, what's our title, Tori? Uh, oh, community. Oh, competition. Yes, one example of community competition. There we go. I have a question. Yeah, Tori. So fundamental, you said, was everything you think that would happen? Well, it's where you would expect to find the animal because it's everywhere you find everything the species needs. Okay. Yes, where you actually find it. And oftentimes the realized is a lot smaller than the fundamental. And the best explanation for that is it's a result of competition, these negative-negative interactions. Okay? So that does a good job of explaining, like, maybe species that aren't really similar, like a barnacle and a California mussel. Let's give a specific type of barnacle, a gooseneck barnacle, that you'll find here and a California mussel. Okay. Mytilus californianus, or maybe it's californicus? Anyways, one of those two. This, the genus is Mytilus. But what about really closely related species? Okay. Like they, one of the illustrations in the textbook were two very similar lizards in an island. And you're like, they're lizards, what exactly do they need to survive? Well, they're, they're cold-blooded, so they need access to sunlight so they can warm their body up so that they can metabolize and do wonderful things. And then they need food to eat. They need maybe a place to lay their eggs. Okay, they're not incredibly specialized animals, right? We find lizards here, and you're like, wow, this isn't really that great a place to live. Unless you're human, then it's a great place to live. But... For animals, it's not all that great, but we find lots of lizards here. So with closely related species, you find what's called niche partitioning. Niche partitioning. Partition. Oh, I'm going to run out of space. Ing. <laughs> okay. Niche partitioning. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. No, it'll erase here. I've been known. To, oh, I've been known to write on the wall, and it's a little bit. It's a little bit difficult to get expo marker off the wall. Just leave it. I won't. Okay. So niche partitioning. So this is where closely related species. fundamental niche. So, so they share where they should be, but where they're 
Yeah, well, so they, they partition it. They, they break it up. So it would be, uh, let's, let's, give you, let's give you a specific example, okay? And, and a specific example doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be one that's super familiar to you, okay? How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say Darwin's finches? Yep. The, Galapagos? the Galapagos finches. Yeah, the Galapagos finches or Darwin's finches. They're birds, specifically finches, that live on the Galapagos Islands. Okay, the Galapagos Islands is a chain of islands off the coast of South America. Belong to Ecuador. You don't remember that? I've never been there either. It'd be a wonderful place to go. All right. So in niche partitioning, you get these closely related finch species and they become separate species. And then in places where they overlap, you find that they actually divvy up that fundamental niche into parts that each of them can have, okay? So imagine you're on an island, okay? Somebody tell me what you find on islands. Water, okay, at least, at least salt water. Yeah, you may not have a great reliable source of fresh water, but it's surrounded, I mean, unless it's an island in the middle of the lake, it's surrounded by seawater, okay? Plenty of water, what else? Sand. Sand? I love it. What else? Palm trees, Palm trees right? Yeah. And so islands, what, it does depend on which it's island, like tropical but island tropical like islands island. have lots of palm trees. We can make it more general, and we'll just say trees, plants, shrubbery, right? Shrubbery. Little animals. Little animals. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll go with little animals. Lizards, maybe, if they've been introduced. Uh, in the Bahamas, there are, Baha wait, what is it? Bahamanian uh, iguanas all over the hate islands. Iguanas. Oh, you hate iguanas? Hate iguanas. Oh, these, but these are Bahamanian like iguanas. Oh. Okay. So let's all, let's, let's, let's boil this down to on island, you find food and you find animals, right? And you're like, well, food, I mean, isn't that food like a plant or something like that? That it seems like you're biasing it towards animals. You're right. It's because I am one, right? And so, um, so we've got food for animals and we have animals on islands, okay? And let's say you're a bird. Specifically, you're a finch. What do you imagine you eat? There's basically, there, for most birds, there are two options. You either eat seeds or you eat insects and worms and stuff. We would just lump all those together and say invertebrates. And you're like, well, what about what about hawks and eagles and owls and 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 rap other raptors, right? But we're safe for most birds. You either eat invertebrates or you eat seeds, okay? Or maybe fruit, yeah, rodents. But that's not for so finches are seed eating birds. They eat seeds. So what would the fundamental niche of a finch species be? Yeah, Kyle. Okay, well, so we're not describing the bird right now. We're describing everything it needs to survive, right? And then I'll... Wait, so just did you say long beaks? Well, that's a characteristic of the bird. But wouldn't they need that if they were... They would. Oh, I see what you're going with here. See, oh, okay. Let me explain something. Let me explain something. So this is everything a species needs from the environment. Yeah, no, I, I got you, Kyle, that's my fault. That's my fault, I'll, I'll take the blame for that. Yeah, but it wasn't clear. Maybe you know you knew what I was talking about because you, you assumed something different than Kyle did, okay? So everything a species needs from the environment, okay? So it's fundamental niche, remember, is gonna be all the places we would expect to find it because it has everything the animal needs. And so if you're a finch, what do you need, Mark? Places that are safe from predators. Right, so you need, you, and the wonderful thing about being islands is there probably aren't any predators unless somebody introduced them. But yeah, other than that, you need a place to actually, you need a safe place to make a nest, uh, to hide from, from predators. Tori? You need seeds. You need seeds. And you need lots of seeds, right? Yeah. And so if you're just a general finch, you're like small seeds, medium seeds, big seeds, it's cool, like I'll eat them all, right? Yeah. But let's say you have two closely related finches living on the same island. 
Now you can eat them all because you've got to partition the niche. So you've got to share the seeds. And so one of those species is going to take the small seeds and the other one takes the large seeds. Okay? So you partition, you split up that niche so that you can share it, so that the two closely related species can share that fundamental niche. Okay, you partition it. So, right, you know, like a partition, like a false wall that you use to separate a room? Splitting. Okay, yeah. Emma? So, one species gets a smaller size of seed, do they receive more than other species? Potentially, right, there should be a relationship between the size of seed and the number. Right? So if, if, I mean, think about it. If a plant's producing small seeds, it's probably producing more seeds than it would a large. But think about it, if the birds are about the same size and they're just eating different size seeds, you have to eat more small <coughs> seeds than you do large seeds. So yeah, there probably are more small seeds, but you have to eat more. Right? It's like eating chicken wings versus eating like a drumstick. You know, like chicken wings, <coughs> things are small. You gotta eat like 40 of them, right? <laughs> to you get your fill. <laughs> I don't understand like what's so funny. <laughs> Trini, uh, okay. did you? I did, but um, I think I get it. Like, if, they, if some species gets another, like it's more than another species, wouldn't that lead to competition? Like, yeah, well, it, it, they, the reason why they partition the niche is to minimize competition. So you're like, so the, the partitioning the niche is in response to that competition. So they're competing for resources, and so what will happen is they'll just, they'll divvy up the niche, and it's not like they're thinking like, hey, we should be, we, sh we should work this out, right? We should really care about conflict, conflict resolution, and we're going to try to work out our issues with this closely related species. So we'll take the big seeds. You take the small seeds, and we'll just coexist, right? We'll get along. So what's going on, it happens as a result of the competition. Because one of the species starts to exploit the big seeds, and then the other species is left with what's left. They get whatever's left over, which happens to be the small seeds. So that's fair. Like, well, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's fair. It's just that's, that's what happens. So it's not like it may not be fair because what you'll find is a lot of the times in response to drought, the, the little seeds get eaten really quickly because a lot of things will eat the little seeds. But the big seeds, right, it's like a, a, a large nut versus a small nut. The bigger the nut is, the thicker the shell and the harder it is to get access to what's inside. Same thing is true for the seeds. Okay? Bigger seeds are hard to, harder to exploit. And so what you have is in bad years where there's drought, the little seeds disappear very quickly and the big seeds are all that's left. So oftentimes it's not fair. It's just that's what happens, right? It's like my younger brother, he got only what I didn't want, right? He got whatever was left over. But it, it didn't matter if that was fair because that's what was required for his survival. <laughs> right? Does it make sense? Okay, so that's what's, what, what closely related species will do. They'll partition up the niche, not because they chose to, but because they have to. Because if they don't, one of them's going to go extinct. And yeah. how closely related are you talking about? In this case, the two finches, um, by closely related, it probably wasn't all that long ago that they were a single species. And probably wasn't all that long ago, maybe in the last 500 to 1,000 years, they were a single species, and now they're two. So like two different birds. Maybe. Yeah. But not just any two bird species, but two finch species living in the same place. Very closely related. Yeah. We're not talking about, I don't know, like a, a lion and a tiger. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, those, those are completely different geographical areas. If you put them in the same area, th their lifestyles are so different, they wouldn't have to partition the niche because their niches are so different. Okay. But anyways. Right? You're like, if you put them in a zoo, they'll kill each other, so you have to put them in different exhibits. Right? They're not partitioning the niche. You just keep them separate. Uh, it, I, I don't know. It depends on the type of tiger. And how is Well, so lionesses are fairly small. Female tigers are enormous. Male lions are big, but they're very lazy, and they usually only fight other lions. They very rarely do anything else. So, like, the lionesses hunt and kill, and then they bring food to the lions. The lions really just fight other lions. So, basically, the 
the tiger would attack, but the male tiger wouldn't fight back. But the I don't know. I'm sure you can find documentation of where they tried to put them together, and you can find data to answer the question. Well, yeah, the, the, so like they'll breed them, but they do it, uh, they do it with uh, artificial insemination. They don't actually get a lion and a tiger to breed. They take this the sperm from a lion and fertilize ova from a tiger. What? Well, no. So they'll do artificial insemination. What they'll do is they'll take like lion sperm and then they'll artificially inseminate a female tiger and then just allow her to care, yeah. carry that, that baby and then you get a liger. Would the female get mad when she births a liger? I don't know, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know, I've not seen those games. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, probably, they probably don't know that it's not an, a normal oh. child because the only animals that usually are really good at telling who is actually their offspring and who isn't are those that that nest with a lot of their species. So they have to be able to tell who's their baby so that they don't end up raising somebody else's baby. So who does that? Uh, penguins, uh, a number of birds that will, like gulls, that all nest together. Okay, so like let's say you put a tiger in like a whole new environment. Yeah. Man, we're really digging this tiger thing. I know. Uh, I yeah. Think it, I think yeah, a whole new environment so that the tiger's got to adapt or die. Yeah, so do you think over time, like, some of its, like, features would change? Yes, if it could adapt quickly enough. But tigers are very specialized, so it probably wouldn't adapt quickly enough, and it would probably just go extinct. Okay. Or you would call that, I mean, that, that population would go extinct if you tried to put it into a different environment. Because they're very specialized, so they probably wouldn't adapt quickly enough. If you took something that was more general, like say you took a raccoon, kind of like the picture of what it means to be a general animal, and you forced it to specialize, it, it would it would do so pretty quickly because it's it's very general. Yeah. It would just focus in on one aspect of what it, what what it's you know what it can survive on. Yeah, Mark. Like, like, sort of branching off of Isabella's question, like, uh huh. Like, what if you did like? They put like a tiger in like, in, like just like less and less um, of its natural environment, so uh -huh. like, gradually getting it to adapt to a certain environment uh, over time, so it could like. So, so if you did it really slowly, yeah, but did so it, like if you controlled all of the environmental factors and you slowly over like can, can many like, generations. Can, can have more more of like so you have a tiger and that's in its natural habitat, then we. Then we kind of like move it to another habitat that's like sort of similar, sort of like similar, still similar to the first one, but it's yeah. also like the, the sure. one that you want to move it to, and then you can't kind of gradually move it. Yes, to. and then your question is, would that would that tiger change over time? The answer is yes, and you could probably do it slowly enough that it would survive it. Let me give you an example to answer this question. So there are fur traders. Um, that it's actually still a pretty viable industry, right? There are some animals that have great furs, and so they make really great clothing or hats, you know, or whatever, okay? And so there's a big industry for fox furs. Going out and hunting foxes is, is very difficult, okay? Um, it's just there aren't a whole lot of them. You have to train dogs. It's very expensive. It's very difficult. It's not really cost-effective. So there are people... Uh, there are a number of fox farms throughout Russia where they basically have taken foxes, they bred them in captivity for the purpose of generating furs. Okay? But the thing, foxes are very aggressive animals. So you had people that thought, well, what if we only allow the tamest foxes to reproduce? Okay? The, the ones that are really aggressive, you just don't allow them to reproduce. You kill them and use their fur before they have a chance to reproduce. And then so over just a matter of like five to seven generations, you had a whole population of foxes that were a, like as docile as a, as a domestic dog. You know, you could go in, you could play with them, you could train them to sit and shake and roll over, right? They were completely docile, just like a domestic dog. But something, then that's all they selected for, just the least aggressive. But they also started to look like domestic dogs. Instead of having really pointy ears, their ears rounded out and became very droopy. They, their color started to change a lot. Instead of just being 
like a, a typical Arctic fox that was brown in the springtime and then white in the wintertime, you're starting to get black morphs and spots and all sorts of different things showing up. And all you selected for was less aggressive foxes. But now you're starting to, they look a lot more like domestic dogs. It's a wonderful question because you had genetic information in there that wasn't being used and now it's because it, now it's coming out because you're taking away the aggression. So the idea there is that there like testosterone or some kind of uh, hormone that led to higher levels of aggression correlated with another hormone that actually suppressed the expression of certain genes. Like genes that would lead to, you know, greater variations in color, yeah, some other things. And so it, it kind of helped us, that, those studies helped us to shape our understanding of maybe where domestic dogs came from in the first place. Maybe humans didn't deliberately domesticate wolves, that they did it in response to humans building these, you know, big cities, and they wanted to use those cities as a source of food, and you can't really be really uncomfortable around humans. And so the, the wolves that were, you know, more comfortable around humans, less aggressive, just started to, you know, take advantage of those resources, and they basically tamed themselves. You, over time, you got a population that was less aggressive, more comfortable being around humans, and all of a sudden, humans had access to something that is like, hey, this is kind of cool. Like, we have these wolves now that are really tame. We can train them to do things like pull our, you know, our sleds. And it's just a wonderful thing, Isabel. Um, I also remember learning this, it's like names for like species, like one can live in like anywhere, and then another one can live only in specific spots. Like, what, what's that? I'm sorry. The, so, it's so, like there's like a name for like a species that can live like anywhere. It's kind of like broad. And like, cosmopolitan. Maybe. And then or like, ubiquitous. Like, those are big words. Or generalized, <laughs> generalist, that, and that specialist. One. That one, yeah. Yeah. Generalist, yeah, they, it's not, yeah, it's that they can use a wide variety of different resources, and then a specialist. And then there's, yeah, like, and then there's like a keystone species. Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. Yep, yep, we'll, we'll get there, but it's, it's going to be after our lecture break. Because I have one more thing I want. Okay, Tor oh, Tori. Sorry. No, it's fine. You don't need to apologize. Oh, uh, well, okay, so with the whole, like, wolf thing, so, or, like, and the fox thing, like, breeding them to be more... Tame. So, yes. You know, sometimes like, like your kid doesn't necessarily turn out like you. Oh. It could be really oh yeah. Cool. I and know that. Your kid could be like completely crazy, just like dependent. So like, what would they do if like two tame like foxes have like a really really aggressive? Yeah, that happens. Then, then you just don't allow that aggressive. No, you don't allow that aggressive. Offspring. Well, not all of their offspring are going to be that way. If you have two tame parents, the probability of having all of their offspring being aggressive is not very, not very high. Oh, so you just breed them again until they're right? <laughs> yeah, well, they, they don't, their litters, their litters don't <laughs> tend to be a single pup, <laughs> right? Their litters, I don't even know what the average litter of a, of a fox is. But as they brought them into captivity and fed them way more than they would typically get, they probably have pretty good sized litters. Like, so if you do a domestic dog, like, say, a lab, the, the average lab litter size and compare it to a wolf, it's way, way higher. But that's because we feed labs. They don't have to work real hard for their food. And so, you know, it's not unusual to have a lab have 10 or 12 pups. Okay. That would be very unusual for a wolf. So and so the, I would imagine these foxes are probably having 6 to 10 pups oh in every litter. But so then isn't it going in for, like, biological... Like thing to yeah. breed with each other to then have more things. Well, absolutely, but that's what we wanted. Right? So it's not natural, it's it's artificial, but but that's what we wanted. Like inbreed like how like they don't want to do that. Like how do you Oh well they yeah, so usually the males will disperse to avoid inbreeding. Um, but if as long as you're not allowing the inbreeding is only a problem if you have bad genetic information. So inbreeding is only a problem if you have like mutations that will lead to genetic illnesses or you've got some weird information. Otherwise, inbreeding is great. And so, like breeding a purebred dog, it's only an issue if that breed has a very common genetic illness or something that's a result of its shape. Oh, okay. 
Like English Bulldogs with their flat faces, they have a hard time breathing. They have a lot of respiratory issues. Oh, they do. They do, but... And then, like Great Danes, they have circula circulatory issues. Their hearts usually aren't great. So they usually die... Yeah, they usually die pretty young, and oftentimes it's from heart failure or something related to that. Emma, did you have something? Yeah, I don't know what, like, Warren's question. It's kind of dumb, but... Like, okay. Besides, like, reproduction and, like, food, how do, like, species become extinct? Like, of natural causes? A uh, buildup of bad genetic inf material. Um, and then if it's not that, it's it's either competition or predation. Or, like, natural disasters. Yeah, I mean, it's something accidental. Like, yeah, you have a fire that just burns through everywhere where all of the individuals of that species live. A meteorite, yeah, strikes in the only place where that, that species By lives. Or, or changes, it, you know, the entire global climate, and they just can't. They just can't adapt quickly enough. Uh, I've never seen okay. Oh yeah. So like, if, if like a bird eats like a bug and then the bug migrates, can the bird follow like the species? Uh, oftentimes, yes. Yep. Nick, did you have something? M Michelle. Oh, sorry. I saw a hand out of the corner of my eye, but I didn't see okay. who's hand. Uh, so I just have two questions. Okay. So Yes. Yeah, on average, we have a, uh, one species every day that goes extinct. What is it yeah. today? Well, I don't know. And those are based on estimates, you know, because the idea is most people estimate that there are between six and nine million species that we have yet to describe, that nobody's described them. So we don't even know that that species exists yet, but we have a pretty good idea it does. And so a lot of these are based on estimates. Like some of those species we haven't even described yet are going extinct before we even have a chance Is to describe them. Is that species breeding with other species that are like... No, most of it's due to climate change. Just... So they just like change over time? Like that they don't adapt quickly enough to adapt... They don't adapt quickly enough to account for how climate is shifting. Well, but how do like more species... Like there are so many species that we don't know about still so like how do those come about like oh from other species i mean just like these finches you know they the we'll, we'll we'll talk about this in another chapter but the idea is basically you get something that separates a population into two populations their environments are different enough that they change and become reproductively isolated and then so if you reintroduce them to the same area they actually become more different. We'll talk about that. Just you said you had two questions. You have another one. Uh, so like, or like gorilla, we are like, pretty similar to humans. Sure. So, and, so uh, why do we like live so differently? Yeah, it's a good question. There, there's there's still um, th there's still a lot of uncertainty about how similar we are. So you oftentimes hear estimates that we are 99% similar to, to chimpanzees. Um, but a lot of that was based on, uh, a lot of that was based on, you know, you don't have a full sequence of the chimpanzee genome, and you're just taking genes from chimpanzees and putting them onto the human genome. But when you actually do a number of other studies, it looks like we're only between 70 to 80 percent similar genetically to chimpanzees across the entire genome. Um, and so... There, there are a number of ways in which you could account. And that's just in the DNA. And then you have differences that are beyond the DNA that we'll talk about in, like, December, January. We'll, we'll talk about things beyond genetics. Yeah. But so right now we're not equipped to answer that question fully. Can I, can I, can I do this and then, and then we'll come to... Okay. So yeah, as, as these closely related species partition up the niche, their structures start to change in response to partitioning that niche. And we call that character displacement. And so, yeah, how they look. And so, for example, the, the finch species we, we've been talking about, right? We've been talking about finches, right? One species takes the big seeds. One species takes the small seeds. And so what you'll find is in the areas where these two species overlap, the big seed, they, their beaks start to get huge. I mean, just humongous, taking up, you know, where like, a third to two-thirds of the total head size's beak. Like a toucan? 
Yeah, but not quite that dramatic. But but yes, get, getting getting in that direction. And then the species that eats the small seeds, their beaks are more normal finch beaks. Okay, and so you start to get character displacement or structural changes that go along with that uh, that niche partitioning. And the nice thing about that is when they were on separate islands, sometimes it yeah, sometimes it can be hard to tell them apart because they, they, they're separate species, they don't breed, but it's harder to tell them apart because they look more alike, but then you put them in the same area where they overlap and they have to partition up the niche, they start to look a lot more different, right? It's like, if you knew, if you knew my brother and you knew, and you knew me, right, and you knew us separately, we actually have a lot of similarities and you'd start to think we were a lot alike, but then you get us together and you start to really notice our personality differences. Right? Have you have you experienced that with people not maybe not just siblings, but you had like maybe two friends that are friends in different areas, and you're like, wow, they're pretty similar. And then you get them together, and you start realizing, wow, there are a lot of differences. Yeah. And then those differences start to, you know, accentuate over time. Yeah. Isabel, did you have something? Um, no. Emma. Um, how does that happen? Because like, they're just eating different things. How does the body know that they're What doesn't have to know, and it's not a single individual's beak isn't growing larger. It's over time the population's beak grows larger because the individuals with the bigger beaks have an easier time eating the big seeds. So they have more food, they make more babies that survive to reproduce. So over time the population's beak size increases. Not a single individual. Remember populations or individuals don't evolve, populations do. Individuals acclimate. Yeah. So do then the small Well, as long as there are lots of small seeds, then they would they would do probably just as well as the large beak finches, um, unless it's like an individual of the large beak species with a smaller beak, then they wouldn't do well, because that species is now doing big seeds, but they can't they can't eat those big seeds as well. All right, okay. Let me pause this while well, we went way longer than what I typically. Sorry, we asked a lot. No, that's fine.